Alex and I are here today to talk to you, um, talk to you um, about some work we've been doing um, with a number of other people who are listed throughout in the citations um, on um, to, to collate long-term seagrass data, classify seagrass into communities and um, evaluate desired state. Um, with this work, we aim to convey what we know about the complex seagrass communities on the reef into something that is tangible and to develop information products that we can use to provide advice for monitoring and management. So we all know seagrass is important for the reef. Um, it's important for iconic species that graze directly on seagrass, including green turtles and dugongs. Um, this image here on the left is a, a turtle grazing on um, a narrow leafed halogely in Nervous Meadow. Um, and on the right there, dugong feeding trails through a seagrass meadow adjacent to the strand in Townsville. Um, this image was taken near the sea bar, um, where, from where a number of you have probably enjoyed the view and probably seen these animals um, out grazing. Seagrass is also vital, vital fisheries habitat and nursery ground for juvenile fish. Um, seagrass also stabilises sediment, subverting coastal erosion, trapping sediment and even filtering water. Furthermore, seagrass is a major primary producers on the reef, which feeds those iconic species, um, but the productivity also facilitates uptake and cycling of carbon, nitrogen and other nutrients. The reef hosts at least uh, 12 species of seagrass. Um, these pictures here illustrate some of this diversity from the small and usually really sparse species, such as those at the bottom of the screen, um, through to the larger larger, longer lived um, species that tend to occur on reef tops in the, in the top and in the centre there. Seagrass habitats on the reef are usually mixes of species and the relative amount of each species can vary across environmental gradients. Today we refer to those mixes of species as communities or community types. Seagrass on the reef also undergoes, undergoes cycles of decline and recovery. For example, these pictures are of the meadows adjacent to the Cairns Esplanade before and after the extreme weather events around 2011. What we will show you today is that some communities have been able to recover in recent years, including this Cairns meadow, but other communities have not been recovering at the same rate. So the objective of project 5.4 is to define desired state for the extensive seagrass communities of the Great Barrier Reef. What we will go through today is firstly a compilation of 35 years of seagrass spatial data pulled together for this and an earlier nest project. Second, an analysis of potential or modelled seagrass habitat and a classification of this into 36 different communities. Third, desired state of each of the seagrass communities expressed as um, biomass. And finally, some outcomes applications and where to from here. So I'm gonna hand over to Alex now, who's going to talk through the um, data and modeling components. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so I'll be walking you through the three steps that we took to establish desired state for a seagrass on the Great Barrier Reef. And the first step that we took was to synthesize all of the available seagrass data collected over 35 years within our group. So this was data collected between 1984 and 2018. So that gave us a data set to play with that had more than 81,000 sites. Um, and this included information on seagrass presence and absence, which you're looking at on the map here, where the green dots are where we've um, previously recorded seagrass. But it also includes information on things like the dominant sediment type, whether or not the site was intertidal or subtidal, and also the survey date. The surveys were conducted for a number of reasons. So these include GBR-wide um, mapping projects, ports long-term monitoring and targeted mapping projects, which generally tended to be a bit smaller in scale. So for example, within Dugong protection areas and as part of the oil spill response atlas. The data also includes presence absence for 12 seagrass species. And these are plotted here as presence only. And you can see that there are some clear species specific distributions. For example, with latitude, there are some species that tend to favour the north or the southern Great Barrier Reef, and then also with distance from the mainland coast. So there's some species are generally the holophilas, which extend much further along the shelf um, compared to other species which tend to um, hug along the Australian mainland. 
It's also important to keep in mind when we're talking about this data synthesis is that it was collected over 35 years and that many of the areas within the Great Barrier Reef have only been surveyed once or twice. So this map shows uh, that data broken down into five year groupings. And we had the initial um, 1980s surveys that were along the GBR coastline. And then we had a period from the mid 90s to mid 2000s, which were um, really broad um, surveys across the GBR shelf. Then we went into a period um, where we've tended to focus more locally on long-term monitoring. So it's been of a shift from those big large-scale surveys into long-term monitoring that are mostly focused around the ports. So this synthesis is already publicly available on eAtlas um, and it's also currently in review as a data publication. The next thing we did was to um, determine potential seagrass habitat and then within that habitat to define the seagrass communities. So we did this by using the seagrass data synthesis that I just outlined and a range of environmental predictors. Um, we then used those to model the potential seagrass habitat using the seagrass presence absence data and also the seagrass communities using the presence absence of each of those species. This map shows the results of our potential seagrass habitat modelling. And I should emphasise here that this is a, not a map of seagrass meadows, but what it does show is the probability of where seagrass may be under average environmental conditions. We defined potential seagrass habitat where probability of seagrass was greater than 0.2. And these are the yellow and the greens on the map. And we found when we overlaid this with the raw site data, this best captured sites where seagrass had previously been found. This also allowed us to exclude large areas where seagrass was unlikely to be shown. Uh, so unlikely to be, which is shown in those gray areas on the map um, when modeling those seagrass communities. And you can see this in particularly large areas where we didn't predict seagrass would be in the Southern Great Barrier Reef. We then modeled seagrass communities within that potential seagrass habitat. And we ran six models to allow for the well-established differences in seagrass communities. Data collection, which tended to be biased towards the near shore and intertidal sites. And also the limited environmental data that we had outside of the World Heritage Area. And this is particularly um, within estuarine communities. The six models that we had represent estuarine, coastal and reef waters. And within that, the intertidal and subtidal zones. So I'll just show you an example for the reef communities. One second, how do I close that? I'll scroll down. Yeah, sorry, mm -hmm. just a technical thing. <laughs> um, so on this slide, we have an example for the reef communities where we classified eight different communities. On the right hand side, you can see the multivariate regression tree for the subtitle model at the top where, we're three, where there were three communities and the intertidal model at the bottom where we identified five communities. The map below also shows where we had site data for each of those communities along the Great Barrier Reef. So each community had a distinct species assemblage, as you can see in these frequency plots. It's come up with little circles. Sorry, technical <laughs> glitch again. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, so you can see here a typical reef subtitle community dominated by Halophila decipiens, and then also a reef intertidal community where um, Thalassia and also Halophila ovalis are common. Um, then within those communities, they were divided based on a range of environmental conditions. So we had subtitle, subtitle communities split on depth and water temperature, and then intertidal communities, which were split on benthic light, the proportion of mud in the sediment, and also wind speed. We then followed the same, proce same process in coastal areas where we identified 13 communities. And again, with distinct species assemblages and a variety of environmental predictors that defined those, divi defined those divisions between communities. So these included for intertidal communities, water type, water temperature, salinity and tidal exposure. And then in the subtidal communities, current speed depth and the proportion of mud in the sediment. 
In estuaries, we identified 15 communities. Um, but what we did find is that environmental data is extremely limited for the estuaries adjacent to the World Heritage Area. We found that latitude was the main predictor of divisions between estuarine communities. But this is obviously acting as a proxy for some unidentified environmental conditions that we didn't have the data for to put into these models. This map shows the predicted distribution of the 36 seagrass communities across the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, the communities with the largest predicted area were the reef subtitle communities, um, particularly RS1 and 2, which are those extensive green areas that you can see on the map. The predicted area of intertidal communities and estuarine communities was much smaller and patchier due to those natural constraints um, that they inhabit. We also identified Hinchinbrook Island as a particular hotspot for community diversity within estuaries and a transition zone between estuarine communities along the Great Barrier Reef. Step three, well, this brings me to step three in our project, and this is um, when it came to defining the desired state of seagrass biomass for each of these 36 communities. And we, when we say desired state, what we're talking about is an aspirational target for guiding management decisions. The above ground biomass was selected as the desired state metric because it's an ecologically important indicator of seagrass condition, and it's also sensitive to environmental change and pressures. And we had biomass data available from 1995 through to 2018. So it was a really extensive data set. The reference data set that we used to set desired state for each community included years where the maximum seagrass biomass was present. Okay. Uh, which you can see in this figure here is an example for estuarine um, intertidal community four. And these are the 10 years which have an asterisk above them. We then calculated the mean biomass for those reference years, which is a solid blue line. And then we defined desired state as the range, which is the dashed blue lines, which represent the 99% confidence intervals around the mean. We then defined desired state as being met if it fell within that range or above it. We then applied this analysis to all of our communities and we were quite stringent in what data we included in the analysis. And this meant that we weren't able to define desired state for all of them. Some of those controls we put on included that we had to have at least 15 sites required um, within a given year if it was to be included in the analysis. And we also set a minimum of five years of adequate data being required before we would estimate desired state. The data for the reef communities was particularly lacking and unfortunately also meant we couldn't um, estimate desired state for the two really extensive subtitle communities that cover most of the Great Barrier Reef. However, we did have a much clearer picture of desired state in coasts and estuaries as we have much better data. So I've included an example here from an intertidal coastal community, CI6 on the left, and then the estuarine intertidal community, AI4 on the right. The same patterns were evident for most coastal and estuarine communities, both for both intertidal and subtidal. And this was a peak of biomass that occurred roughly a decade apart, but that biggest peak was in the period of 2004 and eight. We then had a period of widespread loss of seagrass across all estuarine and coastal communities that started in 2009. Sorry, I'm getting used to Max as a crash course. <laughs> um, we have had recovery occurring in several of the coastal intertidal communities and several of those had reached desired state biomass by 2017. But what we found was in estuarine communities and also the coastal subtidal ones was that there has been much, much slower recovery. So the example I've got here of the estuary intertidal community four was really typical of what we saw across most of those communities. And these trends have obvious implications for how we understand and assess the grass condition on the Great Barrier Reef. So I'm going to pass you back to Catherine now and she'll be talking about some of the outcomes and applications for this work. Okay. Um, well, the outcomes are a data synthesis, which is open access data available on eAtlas. There's a model of seagrass potential habitat, which is a refinement of earlier models. 
There's a seagrass community classification which distills complex information of species mixes into 36 communities, each with a unique environmental setting and unique combination of species. And there's also desired state expressed as biomass for each community. Finally, our approach is scalable if there's a need for it. Just to, to summarise what we've talked about today, um, we've undertaken this assessment for the World Heritage Area to express complexity as tangible information about status and trends of the region. We think we've made things less complicated by doing this, but at the same time, we would like to convey to you that not all seagrasses are the same and nor do they respond in the same way. There has been decline and recovery. By and large, reefs are pretty stable, but we don't have much information on them, especially the expansive subtitle reef communities. Coastal subtital and estuarine communities have declined and are not recovering to, to desired state at the same rate as the coastal intertidal communities. Understanding this historical context is critically important for making informed decisions on the current state of seagrasses in the World Heritage Area. Um, well, how is this data being used? Well, we've already applied um, these uh, outputs to um, for example, seagrass desired state was used as an ecological benchmark for setting load targets, which is something I'll be discussing further tomorrow in, a, um, in an additional webinar. The data has been applied in seagrass distribution models and also being used to assess benthic light thresholds and in reefs catchment management scenarios. The community environmental requirements were used to set parameters in the e-reefs biochemical model. And an earlier version of the community classification provided a framework for assessing um, the rim rep um, monitoring design and representation amongst communities and that analysis can can be updated now with this with this new classification so where to from here well we think we can help you and um, you can call on our advice to apply these outputs for a number of applications these include spatial planning um, in seagrass value assessment guidelines for outlook reporting for policy revisions and to assess pressures and risks overlaid with community types. We can also provide advice on management intervention and restoration. We have good information on connectivity and seed dispersal, risk and pressures, and now also communities and potential habitat. This provides a solid foundation for targeted advice on restoration if there is seagrass loss or if some communities fail to attain desired state over coming years. We would like to highlight that though, that there are data gaps. This is a great synthesis in an important region, but the current data stream to produce this is opportunistic and therefore continuing to use this in the future is based on a sort of fragile arrangement. There's no guarantees that the projects providing the long-term biomass data will continue into the future. Furthermore, the large reef wide surveys are more than 15 years old. And this highlights the value of a program like RIMREP to formalize those data streams. We also have limited ability to give advice on estuary seagrass management because there's really not a lot of environmental data um, on the estuaries that can be applied for all of the estuaries across the reef, um, which means we don't fully understand what conditions affect estuarine seagrass. Um, and finally, the ecology of the region is, is connected to adjacent areas. There are massive e seagrass meadows around Harvey Bay and north into Torres Strait. We also have a vast amount of data for those areas and, and we we could and probably should do this same exercise for those locations. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, and please feel free to get in touch with us by email with any questions or suggestions. Um, and otherwise I'll hand back over to Holton. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, and just uh, another thanks to, um, to you, Alex Carter, for joining Catherine today. I know that we um, miss spelled or put the wrong name in the invitation. So it was Alex Carter presenting with Catherine today. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat for you guys, and I think that you may have already answered one uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense, but from Rachel Smith, uh, why do you think recovery is slower for estuary seagrasses? Sorry, what was your question? Sorry, Alex, the question is, why do you think recovery is slower for estuary seagrasses? I think it's probably to do with the available light that estuary seagrasses have and also um, after you do have an impact like a large flood is that you do get resuspension um, which probably has this long flow on effect of reducing the light. Uh, I think also one of the things that estuaries have is that they, they can be quite um, 
uh, they're not as well connected as the coastal seagrasses. So we have found in some estuaries, like in Marillion Harbour, um, a complete lack of recovery of some species, and that was the, the higher biomass ones. And that's because it's such a closed system, whereas we found that those coastal communities uh, recovered much faster. And I think that's because they're a lot uh, better connected as well. Thanks, Alex. Um, and we have another question from Carol C, which is, uh, what do you do about mega herbivores eating your biomass? <laughs> Carol. <laughs> Thanks, Mal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we can't account for that, obviously, um, <laughs> in these particular models. But what I think what is one of the strengths of this approach is that if um, a herd of dugongs does come along and graze a particular area, which they, they often do, they, um, they you know, feed in patches, um, then the, the community analysis is actually showing the biomass, um, the mean biomass for that community at, in, at this stage at a reef wide scale. So that, that sort of patch dynamics shouldn't have a huge impact when, you're, um, when we're talking about the biomass of the community as a whole across the reef um, for that community type. However, if you, drill down and you want to look um, at specific localised areas, then um, that's a very important consideration and you would need to consider that for interpreting um, biomass at a local scale relative to a desired state set for the whole of the reef. Yeah. And also something that we're increasingly um, putting a lot of work into looking at is that role of those large herbivores and the effect they can have on sea grouse. So we have um, Abby Scott, who's about to submit her PhD. She's been doing caging experiments up and down the reef. And we also have a master's student that's looking at that in much finer detail within Gladstone. So I think in the coming years, we're gonna get a much better handle on, on what that means, um, those herbivores seagrass interactions. 